Hello and welcome to the John Ark Show. On today's episode, we're going to interview actress Kathleen Bradley from the movie Friday with Ice Cube and Chris Tucker. Before we begin, I want to encourage you to subscribe, like, follow, and comment on the show. Also, I'd like to tell you about a service called HollywoodIsCalling.com. It's a great service that allows you to purchase live phone calls with more than 100 celebrities. Uh, you can purchase a, a live 15-second call for $19.95 or a live 30-second call with, uh, uh, for $29.95. There are more than 100 celebrities to choose from, so give it a try. Buy a call for yourself or for someone as a gift on a holiday or a special occasion, so give them a try. Hollywood is calling.com. So without any further ado, I bring you actress Kathleen Bradley. Hello, Kathleen Bradley, and welcome to the John Ark Show. How are you today? Hi, John. I am actually wonderful and blessed. And you know, nowadays when people ask you how you're doing, it takes on a whole new meaning from when we used to ask people, how are you? And you don't pay attention. You better listen because you never know what's good, what they're going to say. But I am so well. Thank you. Yeah, it's amazing how, how, how everything changes under these circumstances. You know, you have to appreciate everything so much more. Absolutely. The whole essence, the whole landscape, the whole world, the whole year, the whole everything that we've been going through this year is so incredible. And who knew? You know, like they say, 2020 is foresight. Did we have this foresight? I don't think so. Oh, my God. Yeah, uh, it changes everything. So before we get to the real questions, I have to ask you a fun question. And that is, when you go out in public, how often do men scream, hey, Miss Parker, how are you doing? Oh, people say, hi, Miss Parker. There I say, go. hi, boys. You know what? I never get tired of hearing that. And then when I do meet people, they say, do you mind if I call you Miss Parker, Miss Parker? Even some of my best friends or relatives still call me, hey, Miss Parker. They know who I am. But it's a wonderful blessing to have been involved in that movie Friday. And it's something that's going to live with me until I die, which is a, a, a wonderful, great legacy. And it happens quite frequently. As a matter of fact, sometimes if I'll meet somebody or I'm around people, go to grocery store, different places, sometimes they recognize me and say, hey, Miss Parker, Miss Parker. Or sometimes if I'm out playing golf with the foursome and there's some young guys there, my husband might say, hey, do you guys know who you're playing with? That's Miss Parker from Friday. Oh, my God. The whole demeanor changes. Their whole, like, uh uh, no, that's Miss Parker. That's Miss Parker from Friday. Yeah. Oh, that's fun. That's fun. It's awesome, though. I love it. So I understand that uh, you were born and raised in Ohio and that eventually you made your way to California. Now, California is full of beautiful and talented people. Where did you get your first break? How did you get elevated above all the others hoping for that big break? Well, you know what? I came here in 19. 70 actually and I came here and was fortunate enough to live with my cousin Terry Scott and her mom and dad had moved here from Ohio like a year or so before that if, if they had not really moved here prior to that I would have been really gun shy having to come from you know Ohio and moving here without knowing anybody so it was a blessing everything kind of happened in divine order of my life and I came here, actually, and I got a job. I did at Southern California Gas Company, which was one of my few and only jobs I think I had as a nine to five, which was a blessing at the time. However, I did manage to get involved in some beauty pageants. And I was in Miss Hot Pants, Hot Pants, <laughs> Miss Fine Brown Frame, and several others. But the one that really helped me out that I landed was Miss Black California in 1971. That really opened up a lot of doors for me to venture out and do other things because the owner, uh, manager of Mavericks Flats, John Daniels, who was also the fat, uh, coordinator for the Miss Black California pageant, was the owner of that club. And some other things had escalated as a result of that. So you continue on with your efforts to make it. And at some point, you get on the Price is Right with Bob Barker. Um, so what opened that door? 
Okay, you skipped ahead a little bit. Okay. I was going to talk more, but every time I do the interview, people say, you talk too much. Let them no, 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 no. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Keep talking. I was going to take you a little bit down memory lane leading up to that point. I think That's it's time. perfect. That's perfect. Okay, Let's, do it, Let's do it in sequence. Let's do it in chronological okay, John, sequence. Okay, John. Hey, John, it goes a little something like this. <laughs> You know, I'm a com I'm really comic at hand, at person. I love com com comedy and different things like that. So bear with me if I get a little crazy. Oh, no. Beautiful. Go ahead. Yeah. You know what? A actually, after I got uh, Miss Black California, won that. I went on to Miss Black America pageant. I didn't win that. But however, I was fortunate enough to go to Vietnam. Can you mm. imagine? I went to Vietnam. The Miss Black America pageant picked several beauty queens and we did a show and went on a USO tour. And it was so incredible. My brother at that time, Scotty, he happened to be uh, over there deployed in Vietnam. So I was had an opportunity to see him. So I'm sure maybe, I don't know how old you are, but I'm sure people can't really believe I'm as old as I say I am, but I lived through that era of the Vietnam era, which was so intriguing and interesting and just, so, you know, disheartening and, and to know that our troops were over there and I, we lost a lot of uh, good guys over there for what, no reason, but actually how, I got- How just, long were you there for? Was it a couple of days or a week or two? No, I was there maybe like two weeks. They, we went to Vietnam, we went to Thailand, but we entertained the troops over there, which was a wonderful thing. And like I said, I got to see my brother who was already over there and uh, uh, Cameron Bay, I think he was there. But that was a wonderful experience. So needless to say, uh, that always brings so much joy to my life. But after that, when I got back home, the manager from the Mavericks flat and who have the pageant owner, John Daniels, he got a sing singing group together, a female singing group called The Love Machine. We were several women, seven actually, singing, dancing. We had an eight piece band and he put us together. And we were like Tina Turner, Temptation, Beyonce, you name it, we did it. We were a whirlwind of sexuality and just excitement. And we worked a lot in Europe at the time. And as a matter of fact, the very first place we ever worked was in Saint-Tropez, the south of France, and opened up at this Club Biblos in Saint-Tropez. And we went on for eight years. We recorded. We were actually had gotten with Motown. I'm a Motown recording artist. And we were with Motown for several years. As a matter of fact, you know, you know the song, she's just a love machine, and I won't work for nobody but you. Ooh, 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 yeah. That so, song, John, that song has so much history behind it. The Miracles. After Smokey Robinson left The Miracles, Billy Griffin came on. And we worked and traveled with The Miracles, and they knew us. They knew our group. And Motown wanted them to help create a song so we can have it. But you know what? When Suzanne DePass heard that song, Billy Griffin and Pete Moore introduced that song to her, she said, oh, that's wonderful. That's marvelous. But you guys should sing it and record it. And lo and behold, they did. You know, let me back us up a little bit. Um, tell me if Vietnam affected you the same way that Korea affected Marilyn Monroe when she went over there. She talked about that endlessly, how of all the things she has done, she had done in her life, she said, uh, she said visiting Korea and, and, you know, and, and appearing before the soldiers had a tremendous effect on her, on her heart. Did, did it touch you the same way that it touched her? Wow. Okay. John, that, I can cry now almost because it was so endearing. It was so fulfilling. I mean, even when... Several years before I went there, I was still in high school, knowing a lot of our young guys and from our high schools and hometowns and places were dying. And you know, it's always worse to think of a situation when you're not there, when you hear certain things and you're seeing people in the newspaper every day and tons and tons of our guys dying. But when I went over there, I, I felt like I was so connected with it. We were open we were welcome with open arms of course and they kept us in safe zones because you know not the dmz but it was just such a fulfilling 
probably one of the most, like Marilyn Monroe, one of, and anybody who had ever gone on a Bob Hope USO tour or anything back in that time, such a fulfilling spiritual movement that was endearing to me that something I shall never, ever forget. And I'm so blessed to be able to, to have been able to do that and go over there and help the troops and just give them some enlightenment, especially, you know, there weren't that many blacks or African-Americans that went over there for shows, several maybe, but not a lot. When I mean not several, but a few. And for them to even be able to, and I'm not trying to segregate the situation here between the black and the white soldiers, but of course we know back in that time, a lot of things were segregated, but just to give them hope and inspiration and something that would take them away from the normal everyday drudgery and, and all the killings and different things that they had to be involved with was just such an incredible experience, one that I shall always take with me. And I'm so happy that I was able to be able to do that. Now, you're, uh, I understand you're a Capricorn, is that correct? Yes, I almost and, wore my Capricorn t-shirt today, John. <laughs> and, and Marilyn Monroe was a Gemini. And the one thing that Marilyn and you as a Capricorn have in common, the one thing those two signs have in common is, you tend to be so good looking that this causes them to immediately open doors socially and professionally that would never be open to most people. Have you found that to be the case throughout your life? Well, you know what? Let me say this about that. I am so incredibly blessed with my good looks. I'm not oblivious to it, and I can't say, oh, thank you. You know, I'm not mild or meek about it. Yeah, I'm a very good, beautiful woman, and I've been told many times, and I do look in the mirror, and I'm very grateful for my genes, my genetic heritage and everything that my makeup is that uh, makes me look the way I do. And it definitely does make a difference. It definitely has made a difference in my life and opening certain doors. And then at some point, it could be a deterrent. It could be something that uh, when I was doing a lot of acting and modeling, commercials and print, sometimes they wanted to have a black woman or African-American woman to look undeniably black or Afrocentric, which I don't fall into that category because of my genetic makeup. And it could be where I could be playing an Indian or a, uh, not Asian, but you know, some, some per person of a different, what they call now, uh, what is it, the, uh, I can't think of the word, but uh, just a different type of person or mixed race or what have you. Um, so at some point it, it really didn't work in my favor because they wanted the crinkly, uh, nappy, I will say nappy hair, the natural crinkly hair look and dark skin on some commercials and a few of the um, print jobs that I didn't get because I didn't fit into that um, genre. Even uh, you, though mentioned, had... you, you mentioned working with uh, Motown. Um, what was it like working with Barry? I, I've been to the Motown studios many times and I'm very familiar with that, with that studio and that organization. What was it like working with Barry and some of the other artists at, at that time? Wow. Okay, of course, when you meet the god of all the recording, Barry Gordy, it's a little nerve-wracking. Actually, I think Barry came to one of our shows, our manager, John Daniels, who was really just such a genius. And like once again, I have to go back to him and praise him because without his guidance and having met him and under his tutelage all these years, I wouldn't be in the position I was, I am in, but he had Barry Gordy come to a, one of our uh, shows of performances here in the United States. I think we did a special performance at the club Maverick's Flat. Maverick's Flat is very, very famous. I don't know if you know about it. It's been around over 50 years, one of the longest standing nightclubs, discotheques or whatever. And they consider that the, West Coast Apollo Theater, because we've had the Dramatics, Chaka Khan, Richard Pryor, uh, Earth, Wind and Fire, people from all, all, everybody came through there as artists back in the day. And so we were fortunate enough. And I think Barry did come to one of our performances. John set up just a personal performance for him to come. But just to meet him, be in his presence was just awesome. And when we finally did get signed with the group, Actually, his brother, Fuller Gordy, 
was like in charge of our group because Barry, of course, he's too busy to be in charge of all the singing groups and everybody. So uh, just being in that whole Motown era and that whole setting was so unbelievable. We worked with the likes of, uh, uh, for recording artists, uh, if you don't know how Davis, uh, of course, Norman Whitfield. Norman Whitfield, he loved us. He wrote all the songs, basically big hits for The Temptation. And we worked with a lot of different, uh, we worked with Stevie Wonder. He recorded us and did some things with us. We opened up with Stevie in different venues and worked with him. And just being able to go around and tour with some of the groups from Motown was just so incredible. I'm telling you, what a great life. I'll so tell you something funny. Do you remember being, uh, I think it's upstairs where the kitchen was in the Motown building? You have the kitchen there and it's preserved just as it was back in the days. And on the kitchen table was a large metal can of potato chips that was sold back in that era. And I couldn't believe it. My mouth started to water when I saw that can because I loved those chips as a kid. Oh, which one were they? Wise potato chips. Oh, you Do you know why? Them. I'm from Ohio. Wise potato chips are something very uh, and, uh, so delicious. And like you say, John, you know, a lot of things back. Where are you from? Well, right now I'm in Alexandria, but originally I'm from Michigan. Okay. And, uh, and I, know, I, I know a lot of people. And I know a lot of people from the Ohio area, very close to the Michigan border. So, uh, yeah. You know, so those potato chips back there, those potatoes were Idaho potatoes. Those were just deep fried and the certain kind of grease that they did it and salted. Exactly. Exactly. Well, to, to, this, chips to, this, to this day, if I walk through a store and there's a bag of potato chips on the wall, it affects me. <laughs> you start salivating. Ooh, oh. my God. So you're part of the love machine, and this is during the disco era. I don't think people today realize the impact that the disco era had on most people at that time. It was unbelievable. It was, you know, it was, it really was an inferno of, of, of cultural activity. You know, when that movie Saturday Night Fever with John Travolta came out, right. it changed everything. You know, men didn't dance before that. And suddenly, if you wanted to meet a girl, you had to dance on the, on the dance floor, on the disco dance floor with lights flashing. Right, so it right. changed everything. So how did being in a, a group like The Love Machine affect your life during the disco era? I mean, oh. did it, did well, it you know what? Let, let me say this. We primarily worked in Europe. We traveled for, when I was in the group for eight years, and the group was still went on for several years. We traveled in Europe, Italy, Germany, Spain, Belgium, Sweden, Switzerland, Africa, Asia, uh, France was our second home. That was like our home base. So we primarily spent a lot of time in Europe. They loved us because we never really had a hit song to take us to that next level because Miracles stole it, which they wrote, like I said at the beginning. But the disco was great. They were so kind to us. They loved us. They really embraced the black artists back there. That's why a lot of the artists here that lived in the United States, even prior to the disco era, went and migrated to Europe because they were so well received as opposed to being here and having to go in the back door to sing in some places because of segregation. But the disco era was wonderful. But aside from actually being with the love machine back then, after I left them in like, I think it was 76, I got with another singing group called Destination. Now Destination was comprised of three artists, myself, Linda Theus and Danny Lugo, three of us, and we were called Destination. And we were with MCA, Butterfly Records. And Butterfly Records actually had several other singing groups that were really geared towards just the disco era to record disco music. We did a remake of Move On Up by Curtis Mayfield in the disco beat. Move on up. Da, 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 da. Hush now, child, and don't you cry. Da, da, da. We did that. It was a big, big hit. Actually, it got like number 10 on the Billboard charts. And we would do a lot of different uh, venues, some here in the United States, the Copacabana and all over. So that was really more for me for hitting the disco era. It really kind of big was getting bigger in the 70s, like you said, 74, 75. But it was a wonderful time. You know, I don't know if you were single during the disco era or not, but I was single. I remember 
when the movie came out, there were discos popping up like mushrooms on every corner. Right. And Wednesday through Saturday night, there were hundreds of people waiting in line to get into all of them. It, right. it was amazing. And right. it, it just transformed the culture. It really did. It did, really. I know. And Studio 54 in New York and different places. But thank God, you know, I was on a certain level. I would never stand in line. I don't care if people knew who I was or not. That was just never in my wheelhouse. And no. once again, John, going back to your, your question, good looks did help, okay? <laughs> well, I'll tell you something funny. You know, you mentioned Studio 54. Um, there was one studio, one disco that had both an outdoor and an indoor pool uh, next to the dance floor. And they had a helipad. And every once in a while, when people got too hot dancing, they would go outside and d dive into the pool. Yeah. And, then, and then the helicopters would come in from the airport. They would bring celebrities in from out of town. And as the helicopters would descend next to the pool, the rotor wash would dry off everybody who was wet next to the oh. pool. <laughs> that, was, that was the disco. That was actually in Michigan. Oh, that Michigan. was the disco era back then. It was amazing. People have no idea. They, you know, now you have an entire generation of people who are accustomed to interacting via social media. And yeah. that's fine. That has its place. But that doesn't compare. Nothing like it. You know, and that's like, even though they still have the clubs or had so many different clubs and everything. And that's why I understand a lot of these young kids really miss not being able to socialize and going out to meet people and have fun and do what they do at these clubs because it's so dangerous now. Who would have thought that just being in a fun, good environment, having a good time would be so dangerous right now And because of what we're dealing with at this point in time. Tonight. I'll tell you something interesting. You mentioned Studio 54. I have never smoked or drank in my entire life, but I was watching this documentary about Studio 54 and they were interviewing people who worked there. And they said that door staff, wait staff, virtually everybody who, uh, who did drugs there and you know, behaved in strange ways, they all died. And the handful, and the handful of people who, uh, who didn't are still alive today. Really? Yeah, I know, between AIDS and narcotics and, 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 and all of that, it wiped out a lot of the people who were connected. Well, I can imagine that, you know, because, I mean, back in those days, too, there was a lot of acid being passed around. Ooh, acid, you know, I mean, I've tried everything. We've done it all. And I know young people like to try and do stuff now. Thank God that's not just so prevalent right now, that acid trip and stuff, which was fun back in the heyday, more like in the early 70s and the love child and love and all this stuff. But, you know, Kids and people are going to do what they're going to do and try what they try. And there's so many new different things out there on the market right now for young kids. But, you know, this is such a time right now that it's, it's almost like stop, drop, and roll. We need to regroup ourselves. And we're finding out a lot of different things that worked back in the past, perhaps, that really not working now and that we can look forward to and making it happen in the same realm but on a better, safer uh, media or different way that we uh, lived in the past. So you have worked both in the uh, movie industry and the music industry. Right. Uh, which industry do you think is more challenging to get into Ooh. and to succeed in? Well, that's a very good question. Um, I, right now, I would say the movie acting industry is really very competitive uh, because the singing entertainment industry you have more outlets to put out there for yourself and social media and spotify and my son he's an artist his name is terrence red the second but he, his uh artistic name is sir reddington s-i-r-r-e-d-d-i-n-g-t-o-n sir reddington yeah and he's, he's a rap artist and he does a lot of beats and a lot of good things. He's been trying to really hit it and make it big. I know a lot of people. I've been mention mention his Twitter handle. If, uh, if you... Yeah, his, his Twitter is um, actually his IEG is Terrence Red uh, the second or Terrence Red. But it's Sir Reddington. So they can look up Sir Reddington, please. Uh, I would appreciate that, his I, IG. And he's got, he's got a lot of good music. And, you know, you can have the best music in the world, best act, best show, but if you don't market it properly and get it out there, it's hard for people to see. But thank 
to thanks to the uh, uh, social media platforms right now. There's a lot of things that are out there, a lot of TV shows too that help uh, young artists that have a lot of talent to, to be seen. But as far as for an acting career, you know, I've done quite a bit. I've been fortunate. But you have to have your skills up. People think that they can just go in and go do something and go on a commercial, be green, and not know what the hell they're doing. There's a lot more to it than that. You really need to study acting. You really need to find out. Go online. Once again, thank God for the internet and YouTube. You can go on there and learn a lot about how to audition, what you should do, what kind of photos you need, try to get right representation, how you can do it. All this is there for you to do, and the knowledge is out there. So there's no reason why you can't get it right. But you do need to be prepared. If you're not prepared and something comes along and you blow it, man, you don't have that opportunity again. And it's very, very competitive business. It's very difficult getting in a role and getting in on doing certain things that you want to do. And, and the odds are really against you. But somebody's got to get that job. So why not you? But be ready and prepared. So this brings us to the movie Friday. Now, how did that door open? You, you started that with Ice Cube and Chris Tucker. How did that door open? You know, actually what happened was when I was on The Price is Right, um, Ice Cube saw the show. These guys, everybody used to watch it back then anyway. And everybody was so happy to say, oh, wow, there's a black woman on there after all these years. And I was very popular on the show. And so he was doing the movie and he said, I have a part. I want that black lady on the price, price is right to play this role. And back then, well, I was really known as the black lady on the par, price is right. <laughs> Nobody really knew my name, except when Bob say, would say the lovely Kathleen, Kathleen, but people would refer to me all the time as that. But he asked, uh, found out where my agent was, and my agent called me and said, Kathleen, you know, there's a movie, uh, Ice Cube, we want you to come in and audition. So I worked it out during my busy schedule. I'm taping on The Price is Right to go in, and I did an audition for the part and role of Miss Parker. He pretty much kind of knew he wanted me to do it. I think he saw me and maybe one other actress, but it was almost a shoe-in. And, you know, that's pretty much what happened. I got chosen for the part, went in. And I, it took like me, I think it took, I take for two days, two different days. And the, the movie was shot only in 30 days and it was on a very low budget. And as you know, it was uh, such a, a historical, iconic uh, black movie that people try to replicate it, but you, you know, it's hard to do that. But who knew it was going to be of the magnitude that it, is still today after 25 years. This is our 25th anniversary from the release of Friday. You no, know, people don't understand how difficult it is to make a comedy. It is unbelievable. A lot of major A-level actors are scared to death of doing comedy because they know how unbelievably difficult it is. Yeah. Um, Friday had John Witherspoon. Yep. And if you, if you watch John in that movie, in some of the other movies he's been in. He's been in a movie with uh, Eddie Murphy. And John, this, there's something about his timing and his, and his delivery. Yep. It's, it's like this nervous energy that makes it 10 times funnier than it, than it normally would be. It is. And, uh, and you know, uh, I saw this, uh, this one interview where uh, Richard Pryor told him that, uh, he goes, John, I love you, but I can't take you on the road. And, and John goes, why is that? He goes, well, you're just too good. There's no way I'd want to follow you on stage. And uh, so my question to you is, when you see the Friday script, was the comedy on the page or did you guys add a lot of that? Oh, man. You know what? That's one wonderful thing about working with F. Gary Gray, the director. And F. Gary Gray, that was his actually uh, uh, movie uh, debut as a director. He had done videos before for Ice Cube and he allowed us so much freedom and that is absolutely what really took that movie to a whole nother level because the casting obviously was perfect couldn't got couldn't have gotten any better with all the characters he allowed people so much freedom to expand on the actual script 
and what can I say, Chris Tucker, of course, he was great at ad-libbing, and, you know, things just kind of fell into place, depending on who you were working with that day, and who was in the scene with you, as far as, you know, uh, uh, Gary might say, go ahead, just run out there and do that, because I have a scene where my husband comes home after Bernie Mac comes in the house with me, and he starts throwing my clothes, I said, and he, but I said, baby, we were just praying, we were just praying, we were just praying, baby, and that, none of that was in the script. And so much of it was not in the script, but, you know, some things were uh, inferred in it, which allowed you to say and do things. And everybody did different things, which made it so much fun and so likable and so natural. You know, over the top humor like that, whether it's Borat or Friday, that stuff, that stuff just it's timeless. It lasts forever. That sort of outrageous over the top comedy. I love that stuff. Uh, when you when an 18 year old comes up to you these days and asks you for advice advice about gaining entree into the movie industry or the music industry i'm assuming that happens occasionally but what do you tell these kids you know actually i do have a lot of people who love and admire admire me and i actually do motivational speaking speaking for uh, young women in particular and just to help people, those women with higher self-esteem. And I've done from grade school to college. And my main thing is have self-respect for yourself. Don't let anybody mistreat you. Look people in the eye when you shake hands with them and be on the same level they are. I don't care if it's you and meeting Bill Gates, but that you're so worthy of whatever opportunities that are in front of you and always obviously to get an education and people ask for you know advice all the time or connections what have you and once again like I say you know I will help people as far as I can and direct them in the right direction depending on what kind of uh, profession you want to be in because everything's out there for you you have to be ready you have to want it nothing's easy you know it, it takes work none of us and people that you might know that are celebrities and have been in the this industry for a long time, like happened by accident. But, you know, people were prepared to have been working a long time. Some people think of somebody's an overnight sensation, like Tiffany Haddish. She's been working a long time in the industry and the business. You may just not have seen her. But once you get that breakthrough, that one or two uh, movies or TV show or something that happens that just pushes you forward, then, gosh, you know, take advantage of it. And, you know, that was true, like when I did The Price is Right, I, I got on that show for 10 years, and a lot of people were able to see me. And obviously, like I said, as a result, Ice Cube saw, saw and founded me on that show, which was a great opportunity, and that led to a lot of different other opportunities for me. And then being in Friday left uh, a lot of opportunities and doors open to me. So it, it's, it's a little difficult, but, you know, it, it can happen. You have to have perseverance and be persistent, and just, you know, um, don't, don't procrastinate. I hate procrastination. My kids do that all the time. Oh, you're a Capricorn. Capricorns yeah. are very industrious. You know it, absolutely. So don't procrastinate. Get it done. Do it. You know, sometimes I, I procrastinated on things and let things slip by me, and it's like, you know, you, you can never reach out for something that's missed. If you miss it, it's gone. Don't let things pass you by. Jump Speak, on it. Speaking of which, I understand that you have a really good book out. A what? I, I understand that you have a really good book out. Tell me about it. Yes, I do. Hold on, John. As a matter of fact, I happen to have a copy here. Oh, excellent. Goodness. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, this book, Backstage at the Price is Right, Memoirs of a Barker Beauty. I wrote this book uh, several years ago, and it's really a great read. And it's about me, my story as the first African-American model. And I have a lot of great photos in here. And I love a book with photos and pictures in it. You know, I have me and the Barker's Beauties and Bob and, you know, just different things. And Mark Goodson, founder of The Price, uh, Price is Right. It's a great read. And uh, it's online. You can go get it from Amazon. I have a hard copy here, which I don't make hard copies anymore, which I really like the hard copy. I'm going to revitalize this and put it back out there. You yeah, there's it. something about holding it. It's just nice. It is. Something about holding a book in your hands. And I was just looking through some of my um, 
places in my other room here where I was looking for a video that I did to do my acting reel. And came across a lot of different books that I've had from the years with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Suzanne Summers and a lot of different people who've written books just to look at it. People have signed it just to thumb through photos and pictures. And, you know, reading is so great. Just sit down in a nice, quiet little place and environment. Just go into that world. It's something, you know, you can look at your little uh, thing on the internet and read all that stuff, but just nothing like you said, John, holding a nice book and sipping on a little wine and getting your own little space and takes you away. You know, like Calgon, take me away to a whole nother space and time. You know, watching videos is great. It's informative, but there's something about reading that elevates you. It elevates you. It, it does more than inform you. It sort of changes you on a, on a, in a subtle way. And, uh, and I think, you know, that has to be appreciated as well. So is there anything else you would like to, uh, to promote or mention uh, before we wrap well, it up? Well, yes, John. As a matter of fact, and of, of course, I'd like the people to, to follow me on my Instagram. My IG is Kathleen Bradley underscore Mrs. Parker. So please follow me on Instagram. And plus, I am on Cameo. Do you know Cameo? Yes, Cameo. I do. That's yeah, something. Cameo, I will do a personalized greeting for you you your loved ones or your family or anybody sing happy birthday marilyn monroe style or kathleen bradley or stevie wonder style happy birthday to a personal friend of yours or family and get do good wishes to them or just miss parker i won't bend over but i might show a little cleavage <laughs> but anyway you know just make it personal so go to cameo and look for me kathleen bradley and it's for a little Fee. Not very much, but there's a lot of other artists and people on there too. It really gives people a nice uh, little uh, gift to give to someone else. Cameo. You know, before we, oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, before, before we go, uh, I saw you being interviewed uh, talking about that scene where you're watering a single plant. Right? And as many times as I have seen that scene, I've never noticed the plant. So it, it is sort of funny that... Uh, it's one plant there. You know, I, I never really noticed myself. And, of course, Snoop Dogg, he really made it really uh, very... Uh, put it out there where everybody starts saying it. And Snoop said, as long as I've been watching Friday, Miss Parker, I know she was watering that lawn. I never noticed. It was no grass. <laughs> Not Nobody a notices. It. It no, everybody just plant. looks at you. Everybody Who just cares, looks at you. Right? Nobody sees it. What plant? Yeah. Not grass. Who cares? <laughs> well, listen, it was a pleasure to meet you. You're as nice in person as you are on the screen. I want to thank you for your time and um, wish you all the best. To you, and your, to you and your son, by the way. Thank you very much. Yes, John, I appreciate this. And good luck to you with your new show. Let's get it out there. Let everybody check it out. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.